Hey guys, Ethan again, and this is the second installment of what I'm tentatively calling The Right to Roam TV. And the reason I call it that is one, because that's the title of my blog, and naming things has never been my strong suit, but also because the content uh, is very similar to the blog in that uh, kind of it has this wide ranging ability to roam around between the topics of my interests. So, uh, if you haven't seen this before, what it ends up being is me standing in front of the camera cooking a meal while I talk about entrepreneurship and or travel and or anything else that's on my mind. And the reason I do this is because it gives me an excuse to get away from my desk for about an hour a day uh, and just have some good food and engage with other people who are also building businesses or interested in travel. So, quickly, tell you a little bit about what's going on. This is going to be a shorter episode because I got to jump on a call right after this. So I'm actually just whipping up a quick snack. Uh, got a good glass of wine. This wine is it's called Otra Vida. It's a Malbec from Argentina and it's quite tasty. I've been kind of slowly drinking this over the course of the last few days. It's it's not expensive. It's maybe seven pounds a bottle. And for those of you who are new, the reason it's in pounds is because I'm in England right now. Um, just kind of traveling around for the next couple of months. So, without further ado, the meal for the night. This is, this is going to be interesting because this is a slight tweak on something that's in the book, The 4-Hour Chef. The 4-Hour Chef is probably one of my favorite cookbooks, um, written by Tim Ferriss, same guy who wrote The 4-Hour Workweek, and it's a really, really good look at how to cook step-by-step. -step. Uh, it tries to teach you the process of cooking, the ideas behind cooking, rather than just how to complete a certain number of recipes, which I think is really useful. Uh, but also, it introduces you to a lot of different ideas um, in a subject called meta-learning. So it teaches you how to learn any skill, and it teaches you that through cooking. It's a really cool book. I've been a fan for a long time. And the thing I wanted to tell you about it is, I had the physical copy uh, since it came out. And I've dragged my feet in getting the Kindle copy, because I didn't want to pay for the same book twice. And yesterday, I finally decided to pull the trigger and get the Kindle copy because I'm over here without without my physical copy. And uh, lo and behold, Amazon was able to tell that I'd already bought the physical copy and they uh, offered the Kindle copy at 99 cents. So I don't know if that's a deal that's going on forever or if it's just for people who pre-ordered it or if it's just for people who ordered the physical copy you know, back when it first came out. But if you're an owner of the physical copy or you're thinking about getting it, take a look at that and see if it's available for you as well. Highly recommend the book. This meal is, uh, what do they call this? It's like Grand Central Zucchini. So Union Square Zucchini. And basically it's just sauteed zucchini, but it's done in kind of an interesting way. So I've got a pan here. I'm going to start heating up some butter in it. Hopefully. Butter won't burn before we get to the point of the cooking. So just a relatively good slice of butter goes right in the pan. Try not to chop your fingers off. And then we've got just one green zucchini here. And all I'm going to do is just cut one of the ends off. And then you ditch the knife and instead pick up it's a vegetable peeler something like you'd use on uh, cucumbers and then all you're supposed to do is you just take this you get a bowl you hold your vegetable peeler over it and just keep raking it over the vegetable peeler and I'll show you what this is creating It's these really thin 
slices of zucchini. And this is basically mimicking the, the job of a tool called a mandolin. So in pro kitchens and also in a lot of home kitchens, there's a tool called a mandolin, which is used to, to get uh, uniform slices of vegetables. And I think you can use it on meats too. Super fast. This is a little bit of a kitchen hack, I guess you'd call it, but it's kind of cool that you can use the vegetable slicer to, to mimic the same results. So, vegetable peeler, cucumber, and just go until the, or, not a cucumber, a zucchini. Go until the zucchini is completely sliced. And while I'm doing this, I'm going to dive into a couple of the subjects that I found today, because I did find a couple good resources that I wanted to be sure to tell you about. Speaking of the four-hour chef, let's start there. A couple of cool things that have occurred to me while going through that. Um, one is the idea... So, as a business owner, I think it's very common for people to think that they want to build the next Facebook or the next Google and there's a lot of pressure put on us to be kind of fam well, famous. Famous is the simple word for it. Um, but what I've found just in watching interviews and consuming content is that there are people who do quite well and they're famous within their niche, or their niche but they're completely unknown outside of it. And I'll give you a couple of good examples. So Tim Ferriss is one of them. Like I said, if you've if you're familiar with this work, then you know who he is, and you know that he's a big deal. He's got a number one rated podcast, a number one rated TV show, three best-selling books. He's, he's the real deal when it comes to publishing, and yet there are hundreds of thousands, millions of people who've never heard of him. And if you were to walk down the street and ask ten people at random whether or not they've heard of his books, you'd probably get at least five or six who hadn't. You know, it's just goes to show you that you can be extremely successful, extremely successful, and still not have that kind of household name. And I don't, and that's not a knock. What that is, is that's reassuring. Because what it means is that if you focus on attacking your segment really, really well, um, you, you don't need the notoriety. You don't need to be like a Kardashian who, everybody's heard of the Kardashians. Old people, young people, everybody in between knows who they are. But you don't need to get that big. Everybody's heard of Facebook, everybody's heard of Google, but you don't need to get that big. You can comfortably exist um, at a place somewhat short of that and still be absolutely killing it. I thought that was interesting, and that was really brought home to me when I was watching interviews uh, with Tim Ferriss. So, uh, he's one example because I frequently ask people if they've heard of his work, and I often am told no. But then there's another guy, Gary Vaynerchuk, who I was only partially aware of uh, for the longest time. In fact, funny coincidence, he happens to be featured in The 4-Hour Chef, but I stumbled across his show, Ask Gary V, yesterday, and it's a phenomenal show. I really enjoy it. Um, and I've, I've heard of his books before, but I've never been really exposed to his work before yesterday. Uh, and this is a guy, again, who's kind of at the top, he's at the top of his game and he's killing it. Uh, another guy, I'm, I don't know the host's name, but the show is called Inside Quest. Another great show, and I'll link to it in the notes. I really recommend you check it out. Uh, the host there does a fantastic job of interviewing and engaging interviewees and really asking questions that I think go beyond your standard, oh, why did you write this book? What inspired you? Blah, 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 blah. He really gets to the meat of it, uh, which I think is rare in an interviewer. It's, it's, it's cool to find interviewers who can really ask the hard questions. But again, I had never heard of him, and I've been in this game for years. So uh, you can be very successful without having a huge amount of notoriety. To that end, there is an article, and if you're a Tim Ferriss fan, you've heard of this one. It's called 1,000 True Fans by Kevin Kelly. I'll link to that one. And basically what it, it goes to show is 
that in this day and age, if you can find 1,000 people who really love what you do, that can be enough to support you. 1,000 people, that's one person in every town in Britain. So the demands on your traffic are much smaller than you might at first expect. And this is something that I, that I talk to uh, my coaching clients about quite often. Just getting over that initial kind of desire to build a huge traffic website and focus on what is your real goal and what kind of traffic do you really need in order to accomplish that. Because traffic alone isn't the goal. Traffic alone is just expensive. And it's difficult to catch and it's difficult to maintain. What's the real goal? Are you going for income? Are you going for influence? What, what, what's the real goal? And what kind of traffic do you need in order to achieve that goal? So that was one idea that, uh, one idea and a couple of resources that I came across in the last couple of, in the last day or so that, that I just wanted to mention. The other thing that I want to mention real quick before getting this in the pan is, is a book that I'm reading right now called Traction. And Traction has been suggested to me by a number of successful people. One, I saw it suggested in a talk given by the head of growth at a company called DigitalOcean, which is a very successful startup in the Bay Area. Um, at one point I was working for their competition, a uh, company called Terminal.com. And we were examining, you know, what their growth strategy had been. And this guy, uh, I don't know his name now, but he had given a talk. And he mentioned this book, Traction. But it wasn't until about six months later when I met a couple of business owners in the Smoky Mountains who, I mean, they literally taught this book verbatim to large companies at a cost of about $3,000 a day. When they told me that that was what their rate was in order to uh, in order to teach these principles, I was like, okay, well, I'll check it out. And I've been reading it, and it's fantastic. Very well put together, and I think it does a really good job of clarifying the process of planning your online marketing. Or, sorry, your online and offline marketing. Um, because I think people have a tendency to throw a lot at the problem without ever really taking a second... To, to pause and reflect and consider what their real goals are. And uh, Traction, the book Traction, gives you a great framework to do that. So I've been a big fan of the book so far. I'm about halfway through it. Highly recommend you check it out. Um, let's see here. Okay, so there's one more thing I want to talk about, but then I'm just going to show you what I'm doing here. This is just a lemon. So I've got this bowl filled with a zucchini slices. This is just a lemon. You roll it on the board a couple of times before slicing it in order to get it ready to get, just kind of gets the juices flowing. And then the last thing we need is a clove of garlic. And we're gonna take the clove, just trim the end off real fast, that kind of expedites peeling and just peel it. And in this case, I'm actually going to just use maybe half of this. This is kind of big. But this is a cool trick straight out of the 4-Hour Chef. And by the way, all right, this is going to sound like the Tim Ferriss is Awesome show. Maybe that's what it'll be called. Um, another reason I like this book is because it doesn't just, doesn't just suggest uh, recipes. It's kind of cool. It's got suggested music to go along with the recipe as well as uh, types of tea to drink. So the music you're hearing right here, this is, if you can hear it in the background, uh, this is the, basically a Nate James station on Spotify. And uh, so it's him and related artists, I guess. Uh, but a lot of really cool suggestions in that book. Definitely worth checking out. Okay. Now, the big difference between tonight's dinner and the one in the book is that the one in the book requires red pepper. I don't have it, we're not going to use it. But you basically just make sure your butter is nice and hot and melted. And uh, you want enough in the pan to make sure it's going to get a good coating on all of the, the vegetables. And then you just pitch them in. So this is kind of reheating here for a sec. Now with the garlic, what you do is take a fork 
and just stick it into the garlic so that you have garlic on the end of a fork, just like that. And we're going to now use that to stir this as we go. And then, so, I'm going to mince up the rest of this garlic. Just so that it can go in the pan here. And God, forgive me for my knife skills. They are just abysmal. But part of it has to do with this little knife here. Um... So I'm just going to mince up some garlic for extra flavor, maybe make up for the fact that we don't have red pepper. Um, what this ends up being though, this is a great, this is a great meal. Again, this is another one that I've made a couple of times in the past. So what you do, you take your fork with the garlic on it, and you use this to stir the vegetables while they're in the pan. And it ends up infusing some of that garlic flavor into the butter. And if you find yourself running low on butter, I just, I just cut another block off and add it to the pan. I don't know if that's proper kitchen etiquette or not, but it's what I do. And you just keep stirring that around until everything gets nice and coated. And you cook until every one of the slices is pretty soft and hot. It's pretty simple. But by slicing them really thin, you decrease the amount of time that needs that they need in order to cook properly. So, last couple of ideas here while I just finish this up. Let's see what I've got. Um, ah, now, the book I was talking about, Traction. One of the things that's really impressed me, and one of the things that I'd like to hear uh, from you guys about, if you have any experience with this, is the scale of the projects uh, needed for success at these high levels. Now, this is going to sound a little counterintuitive or contradictory because I just said you don't need to have huge audiences in order to be financially successful, and I believe that that's true. But one of the things that I think is interesting is when you read this book, you see the scale of the undertaking when they're when the pros are planning and um, beginning some kind of marketing project. So, for example, on his website, Tim Ferriss has got an article. I will link to it, um, which mentions it, it basically breaks down his PR schedule for the first week of a book launch. And the thing that first impressed me about it was that it was, you know, it was more journalists scheduled than I think I've ever reached out to in my entire life. I mean, it's just a, it's a huge schedule. And it shows you that if, you know, if, if you're seeing kind of suboptimal results and you're looking at these people at the big, at the, in the big leagues and, and you're seeing what they're getting and you're wondering, like, how, you know, what's the difference between me and them? What's the difference between what they're doing and what I'm doing? I think a lot of it could have to do with the scale, there's a scale that we're used to operating at as solopreneurs, and you got to get comfortable with the idea of upping your game real quick. Spices, sea salt, which I ended up buying. So we have, aha, Himalayan sea salt, but you could just, or no, sorry, it's not Himalayan sea salt because there's no sea in the Himalayas, but it is Himalayan salt which who knows where that comes from. Um, and then a little bit of pepper, and it should be good to go. Throw this minced garlic in here. For those of you who are cooking fans, I don't know that this actually qualifies as minced, but it is cut into small pieces. Now, by the way, this goes great with a steak. Nice ribeye, 
unfortunately I don't have tonight. Um, scale. The, in traction they talk about a couple of these companies marketing efforts and they talk about for instance social or sorry search engine marketing something that I think most of us have tried um, like Google AdWords it's very accessible to most people it's not got a very high uh, you know barrier to entry you can basically at any budget you can create a Google AdWords campaign most of the campaigns that I've either seen or managed have had anywhere from one to five hundred keywords involved and I thought that that was a lot um, but what I read here is that I, I forget the name of the company but when they were starting up they ran and just as a testing platform to test different marketing slogans they ran an AdWords campaign with a hundred thousand keywords so there's a huge difference there between five hundred and a hundred thousand uh, and that's just one example of kind of a need to up your game that I'm talking about. We need to start thinking about bigger numbers. And that's the thing is that's still not unreachable for a solopreneur. It just requires that you be focusing on that one particular outlet. You can't do by yourself. You cannot do a hundred thousand Google AdWords or 100,000 keywords in an AdWords campaign and social media uh, display ads and, you know, offline ads and content marketing and all this other stuff. You need to have a very focused procedure, but if you do that and you scale it, I think that, I think that that's going to be the key to success for some people. So. This is something that's impressed me about traction. It's just it's been something that I've been thinking about, something that I'm thinking about incorporating into my own marketing, and something that I'd be interested to hear from you guys. You know, have you experienced any any situation where you've either seen huge success from a very small campaign, or uh, you've dramatically increased the scope of a campaign and seen success at there was you know some inflection point where you started to see success. I'd be interested to hear about it, so please let me know. All right, this is just about done. You know, it's just about done when you can kind of see, I don't know if it's going to show up here, but all of these have turned from white to a near translucent or near transparent. I guess that makes them translucent. And uh, and that's just about the signal that we're done. Now, it's got some salt in here. We'll add a little pepper. And then the last thing is this lemon which what I'm going to do with it is just slice it in half and, and squeeze it right in the pan. And now this adds a cool little kick to it, which is very nice, especially in the summertime, but it's especially nice when you have uh, the red pepper in here because the red pepper actually can be pretty overwhelming and the, the lemon cuts it. The lemon uh, helps to balance out the pepper, I think. And I don't know if there's a culinary reason for that that somebody might share, but um, in my experience, it's helped to cut the heat a little bit and just make this a little bit more uh, refreshing. All right, guys. Thank you for tuning in. This, uh, this has been fun so far. I'm really enjoying making these, and we're starting to get to the end. This is only episode two. We are approaching the end of my culinary knowledge. So uh, it's going to start to be lessons that I'm learning along with you. Uh, and I think just for starters, I'm probably going to be going out of the four-hour chef just because it's, I mean, the book's like that thick. And uh, I haven't read it yet. So that's probably what it's going to be. Thank you for checking in. If you have questions, concerns, complaints, compliments, uh, constructive criticism, Find me on Twitter at Ethan D. Brooks and let me know. Thanks a lot.